Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Trust and Believe. I'm your host, Shanti, and today we are going to enhance your ability to trust and believe and your ability to persevere. I'm here with an amazing gentleman. His name is Mario Cannon. You say Mario or Mario? It's Mario. Mario, fix me. It's going to be a real <laughs> kind of show. You know what I'm saying? He's sassy. He's fun. He's very talented. And he has an incredible story that's going to make you want to thrive in your life. So get ready to trust and believe. Somebody say it again. No, no, no. What's up? This is Sean T, and it's time to trust and believe. Mario. Did I say that right? Yeah, you said it right. Oh, okay, you, didn't, you didn't say Mario, so it's all good. <laughs> I got that line the East Coast. I know I'm from the East Coast. You from the East Coast? Yeah, I'm so from Jersey. They'd be like, Mario. I know. And I was in New York, uh, and I was on the show. I was like, Mario Cannon. I was like, all right, what happened? You're like, bro, like, that's not it. And you know what? I just roll with it because, you know, they will show me love, and it is what it is. First of all, thank you for coming to my Super Bowl party. It was lit. It was lit. I showed you my closet. <sighs> kicks. We realized we got similar tastes. Kicks on kicks. <laughs> but let's talk about, you know, we had a conversation in the closet that I want to start with because I think it's kind of the definition of someone persevering. And one of the things that I've been really passionate about in my life, especially I've as I've gotten older, was people bullying you, people bullying people, and people just kind of doubting people because they didn't understand people. And you told me a story about how people used to tease you because of the way you dress. Tell me that story again. You no, know, it was it was weird because it was different because, you know, coming from my neighborhood I'm from, you know, I, I'm from Springfield, but I, I come from a low-income neighborhood, you know, where we, you know, we didn't have much, right? But, you know, we try to make the best of it. But overall mindset of, you know, the black male in that neighborhood, you know, baggy clothes, you know, we we, we played the thug role. You know, mm -hmm. we, we had to, I think that was a time of like Young Jeezy and, you know, all those artists are popping and stuff. And me, you know, on the other hand, I'm coming through with these bright yellow pants, purple pants, pink pants, you know, the matching shoes. They're all skinny. This is skinny. This is for skinny. It was even in style, right? I'm wearing these big uh, Tibetan prayer beads with these cool graphic tees. You guys can document this. And look, I was already wearing skinny jeans and they were calling me gay because of the way I dressed. Yeah. How simple could you be? I talk a lot about how I feel like the world, whether it's social media, whether it's culture, whether it's your neighborhood, kind of puts you in a tunnel immediately. I understand culture, you know, I understand culture, but I feel like sometimes when you are in a culture and you're just different, because I am gay, <laughs> but you know, you're in a culture and you're different, the minute you kind of steer away from that, the minute you kind of do something just, just a little bit different or makes people uncomfortable, they want to make you feel less than yeah. because I feel like it's a couple of different reasons. One, because I feel like they envy you. They want to be like that. They don't have the courage to be themselves. I think a lot of times people tend to follow groups or crowds or groups to hide whatever demons they got, right? Or just to fit in instead of just, you know, breaking off this be naturally yourself. People will love you more for being authentic. You know what I'm saying? It's just easier just to be you. There's that way you don't have to pretend. And you might piss a few people off, but guess what? They're going to love you for being you. I think it's one of the biggest things that I struggle with, especially is, you know, I'm going to be 45 this year. Like my life is changing in front of my eyes. And I talk about this in therapy a lot, how I, I learned to care less. But just truly being yourself pisses people off because they don't have the bandwidth to understand that not everybody's going to be like them. I say that a lot in relationships when it comes to marriage, too. Mm -hmm. People get married and they feel like this person that they're with has to stay the same for the next, you know, 50 years if, if, if the hope is to stay together 50 years. And I just don't believe that to be true because that's boring as f to me. If like, you know, if we're friends, we are friends, but in 10 years, like I want to see progress. I want to see change. I wouldn't want you to not be you. I would want you to to have a happy life. So anyway, with that said, I can talk about that all day. Let's talk about your life. Like, take me back to the beginning. You know, I think you have a really powerful story. Yeah. I personally like 
coming of age stories because you were where you were, you are where you are now. And I just feel like there's so much meat and potatoes in there yeah. that can really inspire people. So you can start from the beginning. High school athlete, basketball player, um, good grades. My mom was actually married for a little bit, but for the most part, as when I was growing up, I grew up in a single parent household. My mom did what she could, right? After high school, you know, like any other athlete or kid, what's next? You go to school, go to military, you go to the streets. I managed to do all three of them. Wow. So the crazy part was, is um, I ended up going to University of Illinois in Springfield um, for academics, right? And I ended up uh, playing ball too. I had basketball scholarships as well. But the problem with me was, is that my environment I was in, I was in the street still. I was living a double life. And I wasn't a street dude. It was just my environment. I mean, I was... I was scared. I was trying to be tough, you know. Yeah. But but again, I wanted that respect and I wanted that money to help help my mom. I wanted to feel love. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, you know, I went to school. I played on the same team as like Eagle Dollar and all those guys. So you know, I got big shoes that I feel. I'm trying to you know, I'm trying to fill that void, right? I want to be important and be uh, loved like those guys. So I ended up um, going to school my freshman year, and I wasn't doing too well. So I, I enrolled into the military, um, the Air Force. Um, I ended up getting kicked out because I got in trouble i got locked up you know and um i, I lost that can uh, you say why or no um uh, yeah i was in the streets you know doing doing the wrong thing man you know what i'm saying i threw everything away i lost it all it was crazy because I, I had such a high potential man i was doing so well in, in, in uh, high school but the difference between going from high school to college you got freedom now so now if you ain't got no male role model guess who your role models are going to be the friends the friends or the homies in the streets who you looked up to, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. And I always looked up to the, the, the always talk about older guys. So whatever they was doing, that's what I, I wanted to do. And the hood, man, I remember where I'm from. I hate to say the hood sounds so cliche. Yeah, but, but I'm from the hood. It's yeah. fine. It's the hood is the hood. <laughs> you know, my goal, man, is so simple, man. As as a, I remember as a young teenager, early early twenties, my goal was to get gold teeth and get rims on my car, and I didn't care if I lived or died after that. Mm. I made it. That was it. I made it. When I did get that. I felt so empty. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Very empty. So after time, me, my, my cousin Tone, we were brothers, you know, and um, everybody around me started dying. Like I lost literally everybody, all of my, my family. I was, I lost them all to gun violence. And what period of time? Like what time? So you're talking 2011. It was a continuous thing, you know. Uh, I think at one point, I think Springfield was ranked one of the most dangerous cities in the country at that time, and uh, and it hit so close to home. And, and my family was so affected by, it. you know, we all, you know, it it scared me, right? Yeah. And and it, and it took me to a deep depression, and that's when I, you know, I kind of went off on the deep end, and um, I got even more deeper. You think you would get better, or you try to do better? You know, I got I got worse after the um, the first murder. I got on drugs. I started doing pills and stuff, drinking. I was living a double life. Um, you could you could tell that I was sick. I was on probation, so I'm a, I'm in trouble now. Can't get a job in in Illinois because my record sucked, right? Yeah, I have to go to another state and get a job. I'm not supposed to be there because I'm on probation, but I got to I got to work. Now I got a kid. I have a kid, you know. In the midst of this, I have a son, and um, that that changed my mindset. Now it's like I got to live for this guy. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes, I do. It's bigger than me. That's when I started to change a lot. That trajectory changed me a lot, having a son, honestly. Because even before my son was born, I was going back and forth to school, still living a double life, right? Still living at, I'm a college boy, secretly, and I'm a street boy. And I'm back on the block, right? Did um, you act different in those places? Like I, I in did. college, were you like, I'm the studious guy, and then you had to go to the streets and act, act a different way. Yeah, I put on more of an act in the street. I definitely did. My vernacular would change, but then eventually I couldn't hide it. So eventually it was just always this right here. So this is when I got people, like my homies coming to me like, college boy, you talk proper. Or I get, or they tell me I talk white um, because I was, you know, I was learning. I was, I was learning in school. Um, shout out to the alphas, man. The, the fraternity actually... Um, I had a mentor, really. Oh, yes, I, sir. I didn't know. I just showed him my tattoo. I'm an alpha. All right. So this is crazy. I, I didn't plan this. This is real. Boy, Dre, um, he took me under his wing. He was a bro. He kind of showed me the ropes. I never seen like a two parent married household that married for so long. And, you know, they got 
family business together and stuff, lawyers and stuff. And he kind of took me under his wing and, and, and told me I didn't need all the, all the stuff. And, I, and he kind of taught me how to be more confident in myself. And, you know, I, I started to you know learn how to adapt and move a little different, mm. have some prestige about myself, you know, about being, you know, truly me. Right. So uh, they took me under my wing and it was great. Worked great for a minute. But guess what? I'm going back to the street. You know what I'm saying? So as soon as I drop out of school, what I do? I'm living a double life again. Now, was it because it was comfortable or was it because like, what was the thing? It was that accessible. Kept... It was right mm-hmm. there for me. That's what I was used to. Com- comfortability. Yeah, You're yeah, right. Com- yeah. I was comfortable. You're right. I was used to it. Trust me. I get it. <laughs> Literally firsthand. I get it. Yeah. But I think a lot of people don't understand what drives people to like, you know, you experience college, you experience what it's like to have kind of like that freedom, that that angst is not there, yeah. that stress. But then like the streets, while it's so crazy, it's hype. It's, you know, it's kind of like endorphin rush that. Yeah. So a lot of people don't understand, like, why would you choose this over this? Was it easier? Was it just comfortability? Was it acceptance? You know, just living on the edge. Want to feel love. I was lost, man. So after Tone passed away, um, like I said, I and who was Tone? Tone's my, my he's my cousin. The cousin. We look like twins, but I call my brother because we grew up in the same household. Um, so lost lost him, and I was like, you know what? I was working. I started working. I really got out of the streets. So at this time, I moved to the small town Lincoln, Lincoln, Illinois. I ended up being homeless for a minute because I moved there with a buddy and um, it didn't work out. Um, I get it. You don't want some dude sleeping on your couch, right? So he was afraid to tell me, I think. And so and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, this, yeah. it just got awkward. I can't sleep on the couch. Yeah. Can't have some light-skinned dude on your couch. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Period. You got, you got your lady here. You know, I get it. I get it, man. It's all respect. Um, so I ended up getting homeless for a little bit. Lost my license. I got to the point where, honestly, I was walking to work. Um, I had no furniture. I ended up getting a, uh, one of those studio type of permits, and I was still making music. So this whole time, I'm a rapper. The whole time, I'm dropping videos. You wouldn't know I was broke. I rapped about having so much money and having all these women. I was so broke. I was messed up. In fact, my apartment, I had no furniture. Zero. Okay. And then eventually, I had got an air mattress, but I had one thing in there that was really cool. Which was a CD burner, so I could sell my albums. Let's go. So I had an eleven stack CD burner, and I would sell my albums and stuff. Now, would you sell them? Because you know, sometimes if you're walking through New York City, there's this guy. It's like they be blank. My album. Yeah. How did, no, they weren't blank. Ah, uh, they be. <laughs> but how'd you sell yours? Like, what was the everywhere? Like, in my sh- I do concerts and stuff, or I just go on the block and sell them. So I sell them to people at, at my job, like AT and T. I like get fans, and I sell them CDs and stuff like that. You know. It was bad to one point, like I had invited my boss over for lunch, right? Um, did this I have a beer or whatever? And and my and I had, you know, the pink slip was on the door. My power was off. Oh. And I was so embarrassed, man. I was like, man, this is crazy. I'm really it was humbling. Yeah. But yeah. because I, I made it through that though, I made sure that I didn't go back to the street and I kept working. Kept working and working, you know. And um eventually I was I started running a gym. I got to run a gym. Uh, one of my customers had hired me to be a manager. Like straight up, like straight from AT and T. He said, "Man, you're too good for this place. You're too talented, man. You got videos out here. I know you're rapping because I was doing shows and stuff. I was doing doing my thing, man. All clean, all legal. You know what I'm saying? Doing my thing the right way." So he pulled me out. He said, "Man, you need to fitness is your thing." Because I was working out, I was getting swole, eating creatine. You know, I really, you know, <laughs> I'm doing my thing. I, I'm getting a little knowledge and stuff. And um, he had me run the gym. And then eventually running the gym, his heart wasn't in it anymore. So he's going to sell it. So I bought it. Let's go. The way I was able to buy it was through my members, my clients, because they loved and believed in me. And they trusted me to not only help me invest, but also to pay them back. So they, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So um, that was incredible, right? So I'm a business owner now. You, you know what I'm saying? My life is changing. But at the same time, man, I'm still entertaining. I'm still acting. Like, I'm doing background and stuff. I'm sleeping in my car. Wow. Not making no money. I'm driving to Chicago because I'm living two hours from Chicago, right? Just to make 80 bucks a day. And then going back and training at night at the gym. Driving, still driving back. I'm telling you. I used to call um, one of my buddies was a cop. 
um, in that town. And I would call them so they wouldn't think I, you know, because I'm like, man, I know they think I'm still bad. Right. <laughs> so I just text them at two in the morning, like, hey, man, I'm getting on the road to go to Chicago, sleep in my car so I can get on the, get on the set. Well, you know, I'm going to make something of myself. Let's go. I want to get into the rap game for a second. Yeah, yeah. Because these, these questions are probably like, I don't even know if anyone's ever asked you this question before. Let's just talk about like the lyrics. Yeah, yeah. What is the process? I want them to dive into how you create your music. You know, because you said you were rapping about having money and all these girls, but you didn't. Talk about how you start, you know, creating lyrics in the bars, you know? Yeah, so my, my music changed when I started being myself. Right. So then my legs became real because I stopped. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I might have had girls and stuff, but I wasn't I had no money. I was broke. But that's part of the game, right? You fake it till you make it. But then I didn't want to fake it no more. So my music changed. And my recording process is crazy because it's all over the place. And in fact, I was recording on the way here, driving here. I just put on beats and rap while I'm driving. People probably think I'm crazy because I'm in a car just spitting stuff to myself and recording myself recording sounds to me. And then I just, you know, I, I rap about everything that has going on in my life. I'm going to rap about this interview in my song. Do you freestyle? I do freestyle. I do a lot of stuff. Have you ever done a freestyle battle? Yes, I used to battle rap back in the day. I'm not going to put you on the spot. I want to, but I'm not going I to. I used to battle rap all the time. <laughs> was, you know, battle rap was is it was one of the first cool essence of hip-hop. Like, that was one of the coolest things. 100%, man. We I used to be it. on the street. Oh, my gosh. I was on this show. What am I... Nick Cannon. Wild and uh, Out. Wild and Out. So I was on there. You were on Wild I was on Wild and Out. Oh, my. I won the belt. I must. You won the belt? Ev- absolutely. Because he be cheating, don't he? Yeah, he be cheating. Yeah, yeah. My but, man. you know, it's so funny because when, when I was younger, rap battling was all like roasting people. Yep. You know, and that's, and that's just kind of how, I mean, it's so sick. But that's why I wondered if you, if you did that because mm-hmm. that's like a great way. And, you know, obviously... Eight mile, like, yeah, yeah, eight you know. Mile. I have footage. Um, people have footage of me, like when I was younger, battle rapping. Uh, one of the barbers in my hometown was like, "Bro, I got um, one of my big bros. I got footage you just destroying people. We didn't <laughs> want you to win because you you light skinned bro. You know what I'm saying? You can't come in the hood slaughtering people. You light Yo, skin. why is light skin people get get a bad rap? They think we soft, man. And I saw. <laughs> no, 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 no. We're far from that. That's really dope. So, all right. How did you break into where you are now? Because, I mean, you were supposed to perform at the Super Bowl, you know, parties around the Super Bowl. Yeah. And, like, tell me about that. How did I break through? Simple. Simple. Just being consistent and persistent. While all my peers, you know, when you're in the local hip-hop scene, you have your local hip-hop guys. Mm-hmm. Well, while everybody gave up and, you know, went about their lives with their jobs, you know, get married, settling down. I broke all those. I didn't care about any of that. I just wanted to rap. I wanted to be a rapper. So I invested all my funds and my time and my energy into my music. Music was first, and that's what I did. And that's how I got here, because I constantly invested back into my career. I didn't expect anybody to give me anything. No handouts, no nothing. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. straight off the cuff. And well, the way I was able to grow was like college and moving around, like not staying in my local neighborhood, but also going to different areas and creating uh, fans and supporters or just getting people to know me personally, my vibe. So that's how I was able to, you know, grow in the music industry, you know, like that. And then that's when I got the Twisters. You know, now Twister just took me on tour with them uh, last year, right? Great big show. So, oh my God, I performed at the Lovers of Friends Festival in Vegas. I performed on the Legends Tour with him. So I got songs with Busy Bone now. What was the biggest crowd you performed in front of? Oh, man, I want to say Tulsa Tequila's in Kansas City, Kansas. I want to say it was at least sixty or 70,000 people there. And you could hear them screaming, hey, Mario. And I'll be honest with you, that was a euphoric high, but I could have seen nothing. I ain't going to lie. The lights, the <laughs> lights in your face, man, you on that big old stage, I don't see nothing. You're like, who am I performing for? I'm just out there doing my thing. You know, I have a really interesting question. There's a lot of people out there. So everything that you've talked about so far is you persevering, breaking down the wall, like, you know, through your own struggles, through losing people. Yeah. I mean, everybody's going through something, which I get. Yes. But there's a lot of people out there who don't have all these barriers and they're still afraid to do what they want to do or 
take that step. Like, is there anything you could tell people like, yo, like do this or like, what did you do that made you like eliminate the fear? The, the first battle is you. The moment you wake up, you either say, oh, I have to wake up today. Or you can say, I get to wake up today. Thank you. I got another chance. When you decide that you're a gift and you're not a burden, then you can start to understand and realize your true value. And that way, other people's opinions and the way they view you won't bother you. Don't get me wrong. I get my, my, my feathers get ruffled from time to time. People sneak diss me all the time on Facebook and Instagram. And, and you know, I got a big heart. So I, I take blows. But that stuff fall off the side. It's a piece of dust. I'm going to go I'm gonna go squat. I'm going to go work out and, and drop some heat. And do your thing. I'm going to do my thing. If people have to pull from within, I, I promise you, if you can believe and when you wake up and you're confident in who you are, even if you don't know who you're, you're finding yourself, right? You're trying. You don't know unless you try. You got to try. Try, but it starts with you. Get out of your head first because these people really don't care as much as you think. So stop thinking they care. They really don't care. I promise you. That is the thing that I can reiterate forever. The people who talk shit on you they're not thinking about you. Not even like three minutes later. They finished the conversation. They got their high to feel good about talking about you. And then they go on and think about themselves. And I always say the people who support you most, who love you, they're the people that's actually thinking about you. They're the people that's actually like, and we, for some reason, as humans, most of us, give energy to, to the people who give you less. You know, we put energy in, in those people who bring you, give you less. I mean, I think it's kind of also taught, right? Think about this. We reward bad behavior all the time. What is the news going to show? They're going to show this guy graduating college or this guy that got shot. What's going to, that? it's going to bring more shock value for the negative press, right? He's going to get more views, more comments, more engagement. And a guy graduating, ah, that's good, but who cares? <laughs> yeah. You, you understand? So it, it's, it's almost like it's implemented like every day with our use of these apps and these phones. I, I think a lot of it has to do with the, the devices, man. Um, it's, it's kind of starting to cripple us, you know? Yeah. I think that's why I follow a lot of <laughs> good news Instagram pages because a lot of times, man, you just go and it's just like people arguing, people are like, for no reason. No reason. And I always wonder. I mean, not that you have the answer, but it's just a conversation. Like, I've always wondered, like, why does drama get more energy than goodness? Especially when people want to feel good. People want to feel good. They want to be successful. They want to have money. They want to live a comfortable lifestyle. They want to go to parties. They want to be happy. But we give more energy and excitement to the opposite. It's easier. It's easier to complain. It's harder to go create and build and overcome because it just takes some work. It's easier for me to say, man, Shanti ain't even really like me like that, man. Or it's me introducing myself to Shanti. And man, he's a great guy, man. Even if he doesn't like me, he's a great guy. I'm so glad I got to meet him, man. I'm going to reach out to him. You know? I had to try, you know, I had to go and, and, and talk to uh, somebody that you, you look up to. You might be nervous. Maybe I'm just, I'm scared to talk to you because I look up to you and I'm nervous. And, you know, I, and I'm, I'm amazed by your story and your journey, right? But instead, I can just hate. You're like, man, forget him, man. You think he all that. It's easier to do that and I can walk away. It's easier and it's comfortable. It's com I can walk away. I'm done. My job's done. I just hate it on myself and you. But you are left with Nothing. Nothing. Not, you know, which which brings me to my next question, which is about ego, because I believe that ego gets in the way of success as well. And so, you know, you're around a lot of people and obviously of your life. Like, how do you keep that in check? Well, for me, ego is an acronym for edging God out. So when, I, when you say ego, that's what I put it, edging God out. Right. How do I keep it in check? I'm around real people that keep it in check as well, right? And I gotta pray on it. Sometimes I gotta just take some time to myself. And you gotta not surround yourself with a lot of people. So you gotta spend some time with yourself to keep yourself in check. You gotta look in the mirror. I've got out of whack. Being around all these celebrities doing stuff, 
I've had people tell me I changed. I had people that, I, that that are dear to me that told me I changed. I was changing, and I, you know, I'm talking about all these supercars I want, and I've been driving all these gold. I want this and that. I want to do this. In the way I was talking to them, and it, they could tell the trajectory, and that hurt me. And Did I, it hurt you because they were right? Or it hurt you because they just didn't understand your journey? Both, because they weren't wrong. But my presentation could have been better. And I think a lot of that, when you could check your ego like that and take a step back, I think you can win. Your life be a lot more fulfilling than materialism, right? Yeah. So without like answering that question the same, because I just feel like you have this really great way of processing presence, you know, the present moment. Yeah. And so how do you manage there's this thing i learned in therapy it's like cognitive flexibility you could either go off the deep end and not accept someone's feedback or you can say you know what i am going to accept that the cognitive flexibility of that a lot of people will hear some feedback or constructive criticism and immediately get mad or immediately retract to defend. Like, how do you manage that? Because a lot of people can't do that. Like a lot of people wouldn't have answered both to that question. So it depends on the source, whoever's delivering a message to me. Because in hindsight, this person could be looking for a personal gain. But if I trust and believe in the individual that's speaking to me, I might have to take that. I might have to take that one on the chin. You know, I have to really look in the mirror and reflect. So it's always, for me, it's based off the source. And I'm, I'm not saying somebody I just met can give me valuable information, but what's their end game? I got to know their angle. Because now I'm running into a problem that I'm in, I am rising in the industry that everybody loves me. Everybody's mm. my bro. But guess what? I know it's transactional. I know it's transactional. But that doesn't mean they're bad people. They're just trying to find their way. But I still got to protect myself. You got to protect yourself, you know? Yes, absolutely. Um, so that doesn't mean they're bad people, but some people are just too transactional and they don't got that. Oh, what's your purpose? What drives you? What really drives you? So is it material? What is it? What, yeah. is it? what do you want to do? What do you want out of life? What drives you? You don't got that long to be here. So what you going to do? We have a very similar philosophy on that because I don't want to sound like this, but you know, people just really waste their time. I believe that they waste their time because of what they're saying to themselves. Like, you know, when you were talking about you were homeless and sleeping in your car, this might be a tough question, but for you, I don't think, I don't think it's a tough question because like I said, you're very aware of yourself. Do you remember ever a time being in the car, homeless or driving or like kind of at rock bottom and having a conversation with yourself? Was it ever one single conversation you had with yourself where you were like, I need to do this to get it together. Yeah, I, I did do that. See, I, I knew what I had to do, but I didn't know what I had to do. You know what I'm saying? No. So I knew what I had to do was a step in the right direction. I didn't have the instruction manual, but I had all the tools. Mm. So I had the, the vernacular. I had the physique. I had the passion to drive. The desire. I just needed the tools. I needed the man. I needed the manual. Something. I need direction, guidance. It's kind of like you have all the furniture pieces from IKEA, but you don't have the directions to put it. You know, I put it together. <laughs> you know, yeah. you got a kid. You got a guy. A man has you know been through a lot. He means he just lost all of his siblings to gun violence. I mean, you got a guy that's is you know he's been in the system his whole life. He's always been told he wasn't good enough. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how, but I knew I had it. Right. I knew I had it. How old is your son now? Man, my son will be 13 um, in a couple days. How is it? Listen, my son, I got a son and a daughter. Uh, my son is, he's like a little old man. He's a great guy, man. Very mature, <laughs> um, incredible athlete, and even better student, and even better son. And I, I make sure that I'm very influential in his life. And your daughter, how old is she? 10, 10 going on 29, um, very intelligent. Uh, she called me the other day and she said, dad, I said, what's up? I talked to him like that. <laughs> I love it. So what's up? She said, 
did you know Martin Luther King had a mistress? I said, get off my phone. I love you. Have a good day. <laughs> I hate the internet. <laughs> she, I mean, listen. <laughs> dude, come on. The fact that she feels comfortable asking you that question yeah, is kind of dope. Though. She's a huge history buff. And Martin Luther King is like her hero. So she's just diving into all this information. She's super smart. I don't know where she got it from because I'm not that smart. Oh, come on. Don't. But she's not so, do that. She's so, like, she's super smart. They're like, I'm cool. But she cool, cool. <laughs> she's like, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. As a professional traveling dad, where do you, how do you find the balance between dad and being a superstar? You know what? I'm getting better at it. I think I can be better. I need to do better, but... My kids love me. They think I'm just the dopest, the best dad ever. But me internally, I feel like ah, I can do better. I don't have them in the home with me. You know what I'm saying? They don't live with me. But at the same time, it's like I'm doing – mom's happy. You know, I take care of what I need to do. And I, um, I make sure I go above and beyond for them, you know, and they're happy. And so I, I guess I'm doing a good job to – According to the mom, but <laughs> yeah. for me personally, but that's a that's a that's a high compliment. Though. Yeah, it is because you don't you know you don't you, you don't see that as much you know um, on social media and stuff like that. Uh, men and women getting along like that, but not dope relationship. My my business, mine and hers. You know, it's so cool. It's, yeah, I get my I get my babies whenever. You know, it's so dope. It grounds me. I actually learned this from a person I work with. My kids don't have a phone yet, but how old are they? They're five. They're both. They're twins. Oh, they don't need no phones right now. No, no, no. I'm just. <laughs> I know. <laughs> trust me. I know. They actually had these um, <laughs> watches that we we did some partnership with this like watch company in Europe somewhere and whatever. But this guy, he has this like really incredible rule. He's like, I always answer the phone. He's like, no matter what, if I'm in a meeting, every like I answer the phone. My kids call, and I was just like, that's so dope. Because for me. I like I travel a lot. You know, I'm I'm more of the traveling dad, even though Scott travels with me sometimes. And so I just love that. And I tell them that all the time. Like I'm always gonna be available. I never tell them no if they want to hug. I never tell them no if they want to sit on my lap. I don't let them sleep with me, but I will get in their bed with them if they like, you know, and it's just kind of like I mean, because I didn't grow up with a dad. Yeah. You know, I had my grandfather and my stepfather sexually abused me. So I talked to Scott a lot every day, which is why I asked you those couple questions, but I talked to him a lot about this when I have these connections with my kids or if there's a moment I'm like, yo, this is so crazy because I never experienced what they're experiencing. Like to have that connection with their dad. And it, it makes me emotional really a lot because I'm just like, you know, I try not to say, oh my gosh, I wish I had that. And I try not to overdo it. You know, like, you're like, I'm overdoing it because I didn't have it. Too daddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I don't, I don't, I'm like, you're independent. I'm available. But I just wanted to ask you that because, you know, you've been through a lot. Yeah. You know, you obviously have that great coming of age story. And now tell me where you are now. Like, I want to know what's about to happen because... Well, I know you're very well known. I just feel like there's this blow up about to happen. And I just want to say that I'm like, I know you're big, but I'm happy that I met you before you big, 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 because yeah. I'm coming to the shows. Sean, man, you, you're part of the process. <laughs> you know, you're part of that. You know, right now for me, I'm, I'm working on an album. Um, I just dropped a single with um, NLE Chop, and it's doing very well. Um, I just recently got over 100 subscri- uh, thousand a month of listeners on Spotify. Let's go. So it's just doing, I'm doing my thing. I'm coming up. Um I got a bunch of shows coming up, a couple labels talking to me, you know. Um, things are looking real good. You're Acting about, is booming right now. To, you're about to smash. I just, I know it. I'm telling you, I know. I know 100%. <laughs> I know I'm not the only one that told you that, but just know <laughs> that Sean T knows. <laughs> no, seriously, Sean, I got, you know, I got acting. I'm getting, getting a lot of scripts sent to me from different shows. I've been reading, doing reads. Um, so I'm very, I'm very active in acting. I don't know if you've seen, I was on Empire, right? Back in it, I did the Empire bit. Um, but that's what I'm doing. Music acting. I, I got my gym going anytime fitness. I own one of those commercial real estate shoe store. I'm doing my thing. Um, I'm having, but having fun doing all this stuff. It's so fun. I love that. I, every day I wake up, I'm like, man, let's go. You're the athlete of life. 
you did mention trust and believe before, but I want you to define trust and believe. Well, trust in the process of your growth, trust in you. You got to believe in love. And I'm not saying like believe in love, like love everybody. I'm saying believe that love is real. And you got to have that love for you to even move forward. So, so trust the process, trust that it's going to get better. Trust that this isn't the last hurrah for you. Trust you're going to get through this. Trust them bills going to get paid. <laughs> yes. Trust you can get the body you want. Trust that. <laughs> but then believe, you know, believe you can do it. Believe and believe in love, baby. It's real. Love is real, man. Um, I think being around people on social media, they throw the word love out there so much and, and it gets watered down. But you still, you can believe there are, there are real people out there and the people that, that, that come into your life that love you might be total strangers. Um, but it's real. Yeah, I think there are people who they like exude love, you know, yeah. because I heard people say like, oh, I'm, I'm not going to say that to everybody, but I'm like a person that like, I truly love people you like, too. and because I feel them beyond this like surface thing. It's not like, you know, I see you, I met you, but I was like, I see the energy. I see where it moves. You know, like if something happened to you, I'd be sad. And oh, thanks. you know, no, no, no. But you know, a lot of people don't, and this, I'm not saying this is bad. I'm just saying people are different. Like some people meet people and they just keep it very here. Like they put up a wall, which yeah. is totally fine. I'm just saying I'm different. I'm a person that's like, I want to dive in. I want to get to know who you are. Yeah. And if you tell me something, like I meet people at the gym all the time. I don't know them, but they tell me something amazing. I'm like, I'm like, I'm going to hype them up because I just kind of lead with that kind of love and energy and, and you know, if I can spread positivity to, to help somebody grow, that's like, to me, the best. The best. Yeah, definitely. I mean, in loving everybody, I, I love that, right? That's me. But, you know, in my industry, your industry, right, we have to be careful because people see that as a weakness and they do take advantage. And that's, and that's where we have the opportunists, right? And then we have the people where the relationship is really transactional, yeah. but we're still giving them love because we don't, we don't treat them any different, right? We still give them love, but we just limit the energy they can receive from yes, them. Yes, exactly. But we, we still love them. And you know, like, I think a lot of people, meaning you and I know, it's like, we can still give this. I think one of the biggest things is to be able to love without expectation. Yeah. Because I'm like... I truly am a person that even the way I love my husband, I'm like, if I say I love you, if I do something for you, if I surprise you with something, I don't need you to do that back. Yo. I truly don't. I would say 90% because obviously, there, you know, I married him because there's, you know, there's a connection. But yeah. a lot of people come to me and they're like, don't you remember you did this? And I'm like, nope. I don't remember because I did it because in that moment, I felt like you needed it. And I, I'm like, I don't remember Yo, Sean, check this out. Let's reverse it. You're blowing up. You're doing your thing, right? How many people came to you telling you what they did for you? How many people kept scoring you? Remember that time I helped you move your car at one time? Or You got to be careful because we lead with love, right? So when we, we interact with people, one of the things I deal with now was people keeping tabs on anything they did for me. So it was, so their love is always, is always conditional. And transactional, like you said yeah. before. It's like, I want tangible love. Yep. Like, I want to keep, you know, tabs. Yes. Like, this is not an IOU. Like, I don't, you know. Thank you. But before you go, I just want to know, like, tell me about the shows. Can you tell me the name of the album yet? Is it, like, secret? I got, I got like, over 800 songs recorded and mastered. I record every week, man. I'm a, I'm a studio rat, okay? I got two albums. I got uh, Breaking Hearts and Breaking Records. That's one of them. And then the other one's called Love Drill. Oh, snap. So, and they're they're two distinctively, they sound totally different. They don't they don't sound close to the same. Yeah. Thank so, you so much for coming on the show. Sean, man, thank you for having me, man. This is I dope. appreciate it. So yes. dope. Yeah, man. Let's go. Let's get it. <laughs>